Justin Miller, Oxnard College Physics here, and what do we got going on? We got the beginning of electromagnetism. Whew. So, what's this course all about? Well, inevitably, it's about electricity and magnetism. So, charge and magnetic interactions. So, we got to start off somewhere basic, but ultimately, what do we have? We've got electricity, right? Electricity is responsible for powering much of our world at this point in time, right? Lights, those are powered by electricity. We've got electric motors, we've got calculators. Where's my calculator? Calculators have batteries in them. We got cell phones, computers. We've got a whole bunch of things that all rely on electricity. And ultimately they rely on our understanding of the behavior of charged particles in different configurations. That's what this class is going to focus its attention on. So, what do we got? We've got a little generator here. I can turn this wheel and what happens? Well, the light lights up. That's pretty neat. I can make electricity. Fantastic. What else can we do? Well, we can utilize electricity and like a battery to make something spin. So here's a little DC motor. And give it a little bump. Whoa. we go. Pretty simple. We'll be studying this. But that's one thing that we've got. What else do we have? We've got, oh, this is a little tube that's filled with a neon gas. Um, you can't really see it in there because, well, the gas is clear. But we can make it visible by utilizing some electricity. I know that you've seen neon signs before. But what you maybe have not seen is an apparatus like this. Uh-oh. So what I can do with this is, well, bring it close to this neon here. What happens? It's not even zapping it, but the neon is lighting up. And ultimately, yeah, we can start zapping it. Ah! And make it really light up. So, electricity can do some really amazing things, and that's what we want to study in this course. So before we get into electricity, we got to understand the basics. And the basics come down to what is electricity. Electricity is ultimately the flow of charged particles. So we go and start thinking about charge. We've got, I don't have the table of elements in here, sadly. But we've got elements, right? What are the elements composed of? That's right, protons, neutrons, electrons. Protons have positive charge, we say. Electrons have negative charge, we say. And neutrons are neutral, no charge. So what can we start looking at? Well, the very first aspect of this course, we're gonna start looking at charge-charge interaction. So, a little demo here. Got some tape, make sure that you See the tape? This is just regular scotch tape here. I'm going to take a piece off and I am going to fold over a little part so it doesn't stick to my fingers. I'm going to set it there. Let me turn my fan off so we got no breeze going on in here. I'm going to take this piece of tape, I'm going to fix it to this piece of plastic here, rub it down with a nice little cloth, and then I'm going to do the same size approximately of tape. Hold over a little tab, and then I'm going to put this piece of tape exactly on top of the prior piece of tape. All right, or exactly as I can get. So now I got those two pieces of tape stuck together, stuck on top. Now I'm going to do one more set, the same exact thing. I'm not going to put this one on top, I'm going to put this one by itself. And then I'm going to take another one. I'm going to put this one on top of that last one. Say, whoa, what is he doing, right? Well, magic, of course. Of course, I've got to start off with a magic trick. All right, so what I'm going to do here is I am going to remove one of the sets. Ready for this? So if I'm going to grab it, pull it off. That's right. That was uh, 
exhilarating. What I'm going to do with this, well, I got two pieces of tape right here. What I'm going to do is separate those two pieces of tape. That's why I made a little fold over so I could get them. So there they are. I'm going to separate them. Ready? Did it. I removed pieces of tape from one another. Okay, so what's, what's so exciting about this? Well, watch. Watch what happens when I bring these two pieces of tape in the vicinity of one another. Whoa, you see that? It's like they want to grab onto each other. They're attracted. Something's making them move towards one another. You may say, well, that's because they're pieces of tape and they like to stick together. And say, well, that's nice and all, but something's making them move. Some unseen force. I'm not pushing them towards each other yet. Whoop, when they get close enough, they deflect towards one another. So I'm going to take this. This was the top piece. This was the bottom piece. I'm just going to stick those right here for right now. Top piece, bottom piece. And I'm going to do the same thing with this set. So ready? Ah, that was not good. No, nope, that's okay. So now I'm going to remove these. Now what's going to happen when I bring these two pieces of tape near one another? Same thing better happen, right? Reproducibility. And that's exactly what happens. They're attracted to one another. There we go. So this was the top, this was the bottom. I'm gonna put this bottom over here, and this top here. So this was the top piece of tape, and this was the bottom piece from the other set, the first set. So let me take the top piece here. So there's the top piece. And I'm gonna bring these two top pieces in the vicinity of one another. Oh, you see that? They don't grab onto each other. Actually, they're deflecting away from one another. They don't want to touch. They're repelling one another. Hmm, well, that's different. Let me take this top piece and the bottom piece from the other set and see if something mysterious has happened. Those two pieces weakly attracted, but they're attracted to one another. So let me take this bottom piece from the first set this bottom piece from the second set and see what's going to happen. Again, we get some repulsion. Fairly weak, but some repulsion nonetheless. So what's going on there? Well, it was observations like this, not exactly with scotch tape, but like this, that drove people to try to understand. Understand why. Why do we get repulsion and attraction? Ultimately, as we know now, well, matter is composed of protons, electrons, and neutrons. And we name a quantity called charge. We have positive charge and negative charge. Like charges repel one another, opposite charges attract. So when I've got these two pieces of tape, and I stick them on here, and then I remove them from one another, it stands to reason from that one becomes positively charged, and one becomes negatively charged. I bring those two pieces of tape in the vicinity of one another, they're attracted. I bring the top pieces from the two, well, those both have the same charge. So what happens? I bring them in the vicinity of one another, and they repel each other. And that's what we get. They charge in the same manner every time I do it. The top piece becomes one type of charge overall, and the bottom piece becomes another type of charge overall. So where's that charge coming from? Am I making charge? And the answer to that is no. You don't make charge. You redistribute charge. Ultimately, we find that in systems like this, it is moving electrons around. Something in its neutral state, that is no overall net charge, has the same number of protons as electrons. Because they have the same amount of charge, just opposites. One's positive, one's negative. But if we start removing electrons from an object, well, that object then has more protons than electrons and then assumes a positive net charge overall as well, more positive charge than negative charge. And whatever we put those electrons onto, well, that becomes negatively charged. It now has more electrons than protons. That's exactly what's going on with these pieces of tape. Setting them on top of one another and ripping them apart well, takes electrons off one and puts them on the other. One becomes positively charged, one becomes negatively charged. And that's that. So this is charging by contact, ultimately. 
And it really has to do with the materials in question and their electronegativities, their propensity to take in electrons. And well, we've got the cellophane side and the sticky side. Those materials have two different types of electronegativities or two different electronegativities or electron affinities. And the one that is more electronegative takes electrons away from the one that's less electronegative. And that's what happens. So we can do all sorts of things. Redistributing charge, maybe you've taken a balloon before and you rub it on your chest and you put it by your hair and your hair stands up or you stick it on the wall or you slide down a slide, plastic slides, and then you get shocked at the bottom or you can kind of feel all the hair on your arm standing up. That's all due to redistribution, redistributions of charge. And ultimately, that's what we're going to look at a lot in this course. So what we want to do is start spelling some of this stuff out and go from there. So welcome to the course. We proceed. I'll be right back and we'll start. All right, so let me get this out of the way. Start talking. Start doing. So, just write some stuff down. All right. Proceed onward. Matter is composed of protons, neutrons. Electrons, non-exotic matter, run-of-the-mill matter here. So, what about protons? Well, protons have a mass of approximately 1.67 times 10 to the negative 27 kilograms, and a charge of plus 1.602 times 10 to the negative 19 C. C is coulombs. So we're going to see lots and lots of coulombs because that is the SI unit of charge. So this is the quantity of charge for a proton. Positive, positively charged, and has this amount of charge. So this there. Coulombs, which is the SI unit of charge, and we know that it's positively charged. Okay, we've got um, neutrons, and their mass is just about the same as a proton. It's a little bit more, but to three significant figures, it's basically the same. 1.67 times 10 to the negative 27 kilograms, and I have no charge. Then we got ourselves electrons. Electrons have a mass of approximately 9, approximately 9.11 times 10 to the negative 31 kilograms. Ooh, they're a lot less massive than protons, right? A lot, a lot less massive. So there we go. And a charge of negative 1.602 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. So what do we note about this? Electrons and protons have the same amount of charge, just opposite. I don't know if that's why electrons are attracted to protons and vice versa. That's why they orbit the, the proton, right? Because they're attracted to one another. So, plus charge, change, ah. Minus charge, no charge. 
there we go. So some of these quantities, we're gonna utilize a whole bunch, like 1.602 times 10 to the negative 19. That's gonna be a number that kind of gets ingrained, burned into your memory, because we're gonna use it a whole bunch. The masses, masses we'll use here and there, but they're of relative importance as well. And we don't really do much with neutrons, because we're mostly concerned about charge, charged particles and such things. So we have this going on. Object that has equal numbers. protons and electrons has no net charge. No net charge. The sum of all the charges is equal to zero because we got some positive, some negative in equal amounts no net charge, if we could say that it's electronically neutral in that particular case. So that's good. And then we've got this. Let's start here. An object has more protons than electrons. It has a net positive charge, which will be equal to the difference of the number of protons minus, or the number of protons and the number of electrons multiplied by charge that an object with more protons than an electron has is the difference between the numbers of protons and electrons multiplied by the charge of a proton. So that's great. And then of course we could have more electrons than protons if an object more electrons, protons, it has a net negative charge. Of, well, in this particular case, would be the number of Electrons minus the number of protons multiplied by negative 1.602 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs, which would turn out to be a negative quantity. There's the charge of an electron, and this is how many more electrons there are than protons. There we go. So this is how we quantify charge and net charge, which is really important. Really important because if it has a net charge, it acts like a charged particle. Um, anyways, so that's what we've got going on with this, which is the nature of charge itself. So, again, if we want to take an object and make it have a non zero net charge, we have to do something to it if it's originally electronically neutral. We can do a couple things. Generally, for solid objects, we have protons are bound to a lattice that form the structure of the material in question. So let's stick with solid objects right now. So how are we going to make a solid object charged? And that all comes down to a redistribution of electrons. Because electrons being much less massive and not really um, completely bound to the material, at least not all of them bound to the material, we 
can take some off or redistribute them. So if I have an object that has equal numbers of protons and electrons, and I take some electrons off of it in some way by rubbing it, rubbing some off, what happens? Now there's more protons and electrons. And that's a net positive charge. If I want to make it negatively charged, I could take some electrons from something else and put them on that object. What do we got? Now we've got more electrons and protons. We have an object with a net negative charge. So that's one way of producing charged objects is directly by taking electrons off and putting electrons on. Now we can also produce polarization effects where an object is overall electronically neutral, but one side has sort of a negative charge, and the other side has a positive charge that's been separated out somehow. And that's what we want to start to look at is um, charges and producing charge interactions. So let's erase this here and define it for types of materials. Then we can go on a little bit. Regarding electrons and materials, there's two ends of the spectrum types of materials. Two general types of So what are those two types of materials that you want to consider now? Well, they are called conductors and insulators. Conductors and insulators. Well, a good conductor will allow electrons to move through it with relative ease. That is, if an electron has some sort of non-zero net force exerted on it, it can respond to that and move. Basically, you have these conduction electrons in the material that are kind of free to swim around. And any outside forces exerted on them will make them move and will redistribute themselves. So we like to use conductors and electronics because we need to have electrons moving around, doing what they do. And what do we use? We use copper, we use gold. We use materials that allow electrons to flow through and across them with relative ease. So conductors, a good conductor allows electrons easily move through or across that material. So generally again these are Induction electrons from the transition metals are good conductors because they have these outer electrons, conduction electrons that kind of, again, can swim around. They're not tightly bound to the protons. They are very weakly, weakly bound. Nonetheless, this is what we've got for conductors. Good conductors, copper, gold, there's a bunch of good conductors. But those are two typical good conductors that get utilized in electronics. Most of the copper this is a lot cheaper than gold, but really expensive electronics and fine gold and stuff too. Insulators, a good insulator. Because 
not allow electrons to move through or across that material. So this is what we've got with insulators. We can charge an insulator. We can have that there is charged insulator. More electrons than protons, or less electrons than protons. But what we have when we have an insulator is that the electrons, the abundance, we'll say, of electrons, stay wherever we put them. Take like a balloon, for instance. I rub the balloon with some cloth around my shirt. The location where I rub it is the location where I am generally depositing electrons onto the balloon. Because the rubber has a high electronegativity. So I rub it, I put electrons on it. The electrons don't move around the balloon. They stay right where I put them. Unless I start rubbing them off or having to contact other things, but they can't move across the surface of the balloon or through the balloon itself because rubber is a really good insulator. So that's what we've got. Very big difference. Can't really use insulative materials um, for electronics. Uh, I shouldn't say for electronics, for conductive pathways because they're not conductive, right? So at least towards the ends of the spectrum here. So we've got good conductors, rubber, excuse me, good insulators, rubber, glass, plastics, paper, wood. Those are all really good insulative materials. Now, there is the spectrum in between here. There are materials known as semiconductors that become conductive under certain situations and to be honest, anything can actually be made conductive. It's conductive if electrons can move through it. By definition, that's what it is to be a conductor. Electrons can move across or through it. Well, you just said that rubber is a good insulator. I can make rubber conductive. It's really difficult though. How do I do it? I have to exert a huge amount of force on the electrons in the rubber to make them actually move through it. It can be done though, but generally we say no, rubber is a really good insulator because it's hard to make the electrons move. You have to subject them to a huge amount of force relative to something like copper where the force that you have to exert on the electrons to make a move is very negligible comparatively. So that's what we've kind of got going on here. So largely, I shouldn't say largely, we'll look at both types of materials. So what we want to look at at this point is how these insulative or conductive materials can behave. So what we're gonna do is consider two insulative materials. Consider two charged insulators. We're going to say point charges. By point charge, it's similar to what we utilize with point mass, some sort of charge that doesn't really occupy space, or a really, really small amount of space is what we can imagine it to be. Some really small um, sphere that's charged would be a point charge. And that's what we're going to stick with for right now. Now, large distribution of charge, that gets a little bit crazy. But instead of writing out little points, I'm going to go like this. So we're going to go and say that there is some plus charge right there and that there is some a minus charge right there. So I could call this one Q1. We're going to use Qs for charges a whole bunch. Just like we use Ms for masses, we use Qs for charge. And a Q2, charge number one, charge number two. So Q1 equals is charge number one, which would have some amount of charge in coulombs, and Q2 is charge number two. 
what we'd want to look at in a case like this would be, hey, what's the interaction here? What do these charges do? Well, we know this, right? These are opposite charges. Opposite charges. Hey, opposites attract. That's where that comes from. So what is this force of attraction? Well, it's not through direct contact, so we would start to develop some sort of force field, if you will, much like the gravitational field. We'll get to that a little bit later, but what we can look at is the directions of the forces. Because they're attractive, we would have that there is a force on Q1 due to Q2, which I could call F21 hat, force due to Q2 on Q1, and there would be, just as well, F12 hat. So we call this force due to Q2 exerted on Q1. This would be force due to Q1 exerted on Q2. What do we have? They're pointing towards each other because it's attractive. And we'll get to quantifying it a little bit later. But note that the force is along the line, the straight line that would be joining the two particles. This one attracts this one this way. This one attracts this one this way, straight towards it. Great. The direction of the force Charges, let me say two point charges. Is along along the line. Not to say that these two charges are joined with one another. I'm just saying that there's like an imaginary line, if you will, a short line that separates these two charges, which you could call some R, which is the distance of separation. All right, so that's what we've got with opposite charges. We can draw sort of the same correlation with butt charges. So whether we do both positive or both negative doesn't really matter. But what does matter is the outcome. So we can take say positive, positive Q1, Q2 like before and look at the force of interaction. We've got the straight line that joins those two charges. And in this particular case, these are light charges. Light charges repel. They exert repulsive forces on one another. They don't want to be near one another if possible. So what does that mean? Well, they, again, exert forces on one another. Q1 pushes Q2 away along the line joining, but now this way. I would call this F hat 1, 2. And just as well, Q2 pushes Q1 away. We've got this distance, R separating them. We've got the two charges. We've got the directions of the force. And that's what I really want to put down there. So we could do negative, negative, and have the same exact thing. If they're both the same charges, same type of charge, it's a repulsive force. So directionally, this is something that we're going to have to keep track of a whole bunch. 
is what is the direction of the force on whatever charge we're considering. And it always comes back to, are they like charges interacting or are they opposite charges interacting? Is it a repulsive force or is it an attractive force? All right, so we'll come back and quantify some of this stuff, but what we want to do is got one more thing regarding charges, and that is to do with conductive materials. And do that momentarily. One second. All right, so let's go ahead and look at some conductors now, right? So let's do this. What happens, and I'll erase this one. What happens if we take ourselves a neutral conductor? Let's draw that out first. So we'll take this neutral conductor. I'll just take it as a bar. Neutral conductor. What does neutral mean again? It's right, it has the same number of protons and electrons. And if nothing else is around this neutral conductor, we have that there's a nice even distribution of electrons that they're kind of spread out evenly amongst this conductor, for the most part. So, what happens if way over here, we've got ourselves a charged insulator. Way far away, well let's take this charged insulator and we're gonna bring it on over here near the conductor. So what are we going to do? Well, if we move it on over here, what happens? Does anything happen? And well, you may be inclined to say, well, if this is neutral, this is positive, well, what's the interaction between positive and neutral? Nothing, right? There is no interaction. But got to be careful. This is a conductor. What's the property of conductors? Electrons can redistribute themselves when there's some force exerted on them. So the question is, is there a force exerted on the electrons, an outside force? The answer to that is, yeah. This is a big positive charge here. Do electrons like positive charges? Well, we shouldn't say like, but do they do anything? Yeah, they're attracted to positive, right? We got electrons in here, the conduction electrons that are free to swim around. Well, now they feel this attractive force due to this positive charge here. So what do they do? They shift. They were evenly distributed through this. Now they all start bunching up over here. So we get this. Electrons bunch up. due to their attraction to the plus charge. Well, as before, there were an even distribution of electrons. They're bunched up here now. They have to come from somewhere. What does bunching up electrons here leave? Well, it leaves a deficit of electrons at other locations. And that is going to be here. We've got some exposed protons. These electrons left these protons swept over here. So what do we have? Well, even though this is still a neutral conductor overall, if we say, what's the net charge? You say, oh, the net charge is still equal to zero. We have a polarization effect here. We have that this side of the conductor acts like it's negatively charged, and this side of the conductor acts like it's positively charged. And what would we have? Well, this charge here is closer to the negative, so it would be attracted. There would be a force of attraction between this insulative material that's positively charged and this neutral conductor. So what you'll generally find is that a neutral conductor will still be attracted to other charged objects. 
we'll say other charged insulative objects because of this sort of polarization effect that takes place. So I'm just something of interest. What happens if we change this to a negative charge? Well, the electrons in this would be pushed away. This side would be negative, and this side would be positive. We have the same sort of polarization effect. So here, let's write this down. We've got attraction now between those two objects. If we did the same sort of thing, different system here. Take a negative charge, take this bar, move the negative charge over here. Just like before, what happens? Well, now electrons are repelled by this negative charge. They push the electrons away, they bunch up over here. They want to get as far away from that negative charge as possible. The ones that can move until the net force is ultimately equal to zero. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. We have equal amounts there. And what will we have here? Positives closer to this than negative is. Positives attracted to negative, and we still get attraction. So that's that's pretty much that with with conductors. Now there's one other thing that we could do is you say, well, how can we charge a conductor? It is possible that you can charge it by direct contact, sort of rubbing electrons off or depositing electrons on, more likely. But you can also charge a conductor by what's known as induction. So I can induce a charge on it by doing something like this. Write this down really quick. take once again this neutral bar I can take let's take a negative insulator here so this is conductive conductor this is an insulator we've already noted that hey we bring this negative charge here it's going to push electrons over here and we've exposed protons on the other side Good. Well, what happens if we do this? What happens if we remove a piece? Or we could go like this. What happens if we add on like a tail here? Inductive conductive wire attached. Well, what does that wire do? It gives these electrons here the ability to be even further away from this. So some of them are going to jump up on this wire here. So some of them remain on this bar, some of them remain on this wire or go over to this wire. And then what could we do? Well, what happens if we cut this off? Cut off the wire. So we're going to go ahead and remove it. Remove it from the system. What do we have now? Well, let's see. We're going to go ahead and take this away. Then we're going to be left with this. So now we've got this conductor here by itself, but let's count, right? What do we have? We've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. We'll say nine exposed protons. 
And how many extra electrons do we have? One, two, three, four. So I remove this. Now we have these electrons. Well, they're attracted to this abundance of protons. They were separated due to this before, but now that's gone. So these electrons can kind of sweep back over and start covering up these protons here. But there's not enough of these electrons to cover all of the protons up. So some of the protons are still exposed, right? There's going to be a net positive charge because there's less electrons than there are protons now because we've removed some. By making them go on this, then removing that piece of wire there. So in the end, what we would find is that the electrons sort of do what they're going to do. They come sweep over here and redistribute themselves until there is some even distribution of their absence. So we'd have a net positive charge. So that's something that's important with conductors is that they can move across conductors. And if you exert a force on them, they will continue to move as long as you continue to exert a force. You may also ask something like, well, what dictates how many electrons are pushed over in the first place, right? What dictates that there's a certain number that get pushed over here? And this is what we've got. There's actually two forces on these electrons here. There is this force of attraction to this, and then there's this force of attraction to these, to the exposed protons. Electrons will stop bunching up when the force on them is zero. The force of attraction this way is counterbalanced by the force of attraction that way. That's when. So if you start moving over more electrons, you may find, well, now this force gets greater because there's a greater abundance of protons and it wants to pull them back. So there's an equilibrium um, number, really, of electrons that'll sweep over that are dependent on how strong is this attraction here. That depends on how much charge is there and how close is it. So that's something else that goes into um, producing this polarization as well, how strong the polarization is produced. <coughs> All right, so just be careful. Are you talking about insulators? Are you talking about conductors? Can they do two different things? And that's pretty much that. So we'll leave it at that for now. And a lot more to come. Number one, there is a plethora of systems that we'll be looking at here. So get charged up, so to say. Take care. Be well. Until next.